History is made of moments. Moments of questioning, of challenge, of change. Moments of opportunity where the possibility of a future reimagined is within our reach. At Lyondell Bissell, we believe humanity's potential is unlimited and the next decade critical. Standing shoulder to shoulder, our global team is focused not just on providing what the world wants, but the solutions our world needs to prosper, to thrive. Flexible packaging that helps to reduce food waste and eliminate hunger. Innovative solutions that help make vehicles lighter, safer, and reduce emissions. Building materials that make our homes more energy efficient. Resins that form stronger, more versatile pipes, ensuring clean water for our communities. Today, we are taking action to address some of the world's most pressing challenges. We are helping to eliminate plastic waste, reducing our carbon footprint, and investing in the communities where we live and operate to help them thrive. We are developing new business models and technologies to advance the circular economy, writing the next chapter of innovation through our sustainable solutions for customers. This is the moment, our moment, to build a brighter future. And we are all in. We are Lyondell Bissell, and we are advancing possible. Okay, that was it. Take some questions. Well, uh, the one thing we don't need an AI engine to predict is the number of books Anoop has written versus the two speakers who were just ahead of me. You know, I, I'd, uh, while you read this in great detail uh, behind me, I want to just set forth three very simple things I would like to talk about today that are the way we think about maybe even first principles for our transformation. People. People are going to be enabled by technology to build the future. The second is really that the center of transformation is cybersecurity and people who work every day. And third, perhaps, is the how. Speed to value is important. Who you decide to partner with to go on this journey is very important. And I have to say, there are tons of challenges, but there's tremendous opportunity. So uh, I know we're going to have a break. You probably all were up late with Tom, so missed your chance to meditate. So I just... Uh, 15 seconds, just close your eyes. And by the way, I'm not qualified to give you any type of insight, but just 15 seconds, think about 2040, 2050, what will the world look like? Let's do it. Okay, that's about 10 seconds. Uh, there is a clock here, so know that I will end on time. The world we imagine is one where food, as it's produced, can stay on shelves longer. The pandemic taught us medical treatment, availability of hospital gowns, these vaccines that were innovated at lightning speed, how do you make sure that they have the right syringes with the right shelf life to get in the arms of people, billions of people around the world? The future I imagined was one where we had electric vehicles that were lightweighted. We had transportation networks that were efficient. The future we imagine is carbon neutral by 2050. We think by 2030, we will have reduced emissions in our company and our value chain by 30%. Uh, we consume nine terawatts of electricity a year. That's a trillion watts is one terawatt. We think that we can build this future together. Those wind turbines you see there in the picture, they're incredible machines. Coatings on the wind turbine blades. Um, an OEM just launched a 100% recyclable wind turbine blade. This future is amazing, and we think we're going to be on the journey to build this together. You know, many people talk about fossil fuel industries, chemical industries, I will say this is certainly not a market or an industry of yesterday. Um, you know, the industry we and many others play in 
is a $4 trillion industry. Um, our company has been in this industry a long time. You know, we're uh, not the largest, but we're about $45 billion in revenue, 19,000 employees, men and women, and about 10,000 contractors every single day go to work to make this company of tomorrow reality. We are in many countries, many locations, and I think over the last 65 years have demonstrated incredible innovation, focus on technology, and frankly, people to have some of these leading positions in the industry. So I assure you the, the vision that we have, many of you have, I hope, of the future is going to be powered by the innovation of the chemical, the oil and gas industry, the technology industry. So let's go back 65 plus years. Two gentlemen, Ziegler and Nada, they were the ones who invented today's plastics and polymer technology. You know, these are the, the grandfathers, if you may, of the industry. And our company has this incredible uh, innovation, operational excellence history. You can see over a period of decades, our products and technologies have and continue to power the needs of the world. Um, it hasn't been the straight line, uneven journey. There's been lots of challenges. As you know, this industry is very cyclical. Our industry is resilient. It's been through many, many cycles, and cycles that, you know, uh, uh, with many things, factors that are out of your control. But I want to orient you to the right side of this uh, page, which is really about investing in the future. Uh, you know, new technology to take plastic to its uh, original molecular format. That's something we're working on. The largest POTBA plant in the Gulf Coast uh, about three and a half billion dollars will be commissioned later this year. Uh, and it's not just us. I think the industry, this industry, you have to have a long horizon of return, lots of capital investment. But we're very focused on the company of tomorrow. You know, when I imagine, when we imagined what the future looks like at Lionel Bazell, first we imagine a company that's inclusive, a global company that achieves gender parity by 2030, 2035. You know, do we have the most diverse supply base in the world? You know, are we meeting the ESG commitments around, around diversity, equity, and inclusion? We see a place of work where you can be from anywhere and contribute. We launched what we are told is one of the most ambitious goals of uh, recycled plastic in the industry. So we have a goal of 2 million metric tons uh, consumers want recycled content, right? Uh, luggage, cars, uh, food safety. Uh, there is a big focus in the industry on market-led demand, and we've, uh, uh, we think that we're going to be uh, in the forefront of that. 30% reduction in scope one and two. I know Dan talked about it for Shell. This is not a trivial challenge. You know, for us, like I said, we consume, just the electricity we consume, we have, a, we have committed for at least 50% of that nine terawatt of energy consumption a year will be from renewable sources. And trust me, we don't like to just meet plan. Um, and then ultimately, we're also aspirational about the role digital will play in this building of the future. So I take you back to 2019. Um, I'm a newbie to Line Double Zell. It's been three years. A lot of my colleagues have been there many, many decades. And uh, it's hard to imagine 2019, we had not had a pandemic. We certainly were facing into a recession. It was about the time the board of Line Double Zell and the management team really got serious about kind of laying out a digital strategy, a sustainable strategy. And uh, you know, I, my sense is you don't get to do these things many times in your career, certainly I have not, but the chance to build something for the long term. And uh, the conversations went a little bit like this. Recession coming, overbuilt capacity, price of oil, price of natural gas. The, the usual ways to predict the future sort of told us that uh, we needed more levers. We call it self-help. There's very little our company can do about the price of oil. 
There's very little we can do about a global pandemic or planning for a pandemic. The thing we did look at, though, is our value chain. So you know, I'll give you some numbers. 2019, our company was about a one and a half, one point seven percent of fixed cost for revenue, which is pretty amazing, very lean. This was not a fixed cost reduction game for us, right? We spent $4 billion on variable costs. We were expending lots of resources in the value chain. So we were mandated by the board to come back with a strategy. We thought for ours, us was a fairly uh, unique way to look at things. We said, you know what? What if we bought ourselves? If we bought Lionel Bazell at the end of 2019, where would we find trap value? And uh, this really illuminated our focus of digital transformation. I'll call your attention to some of those areas. So the dollar sign, let's say, notionally represents $100 million. You can do the math. When you zoom out of your current value chain to the extended value chain, you realize there is almost unlimited potential and value that is trapped in this. I have to tell you, uh, um, we established very aspirational goals. Uh, we committed to a five-year number to the board. I'm here to tell you, I mean, you saw our results in 2021. We had spectacular returns, uh, returned great cash to shareholders, investing for the future, and we are achieving our five-year ambition in three years. But I want to talk about these people. This is a control room in one of our largest sites. We have 60 to 65 large assets. We have many joint ventures. These people make decisions every shift, three shifts a day, on how to make product, but more importantly, how to run a safe operation. How do you make sure that the plants run with the reliability? And you know, what I thought I'd tell you a little bit about is our lessons learned in the last two years in our transformation. Uh, first of all, cybersecurity. You know, for us, it was very clear in our organization, cybersecurity needed to not just be about the enterprise or the operational technology network, it was one. So since day one, cybersecurity is built inherently into our, our uh, transformation. Uh, it is the single largest risk for any digital transformation, but certainly is in the top five enterprise risks for our company. Um, we call it advancing 90. There are many ways I'm sure you're doing, probably far better than us. But there are only four 90-day intervals in a year. Tom mentioned reporting out to analysts. We have four quarters. And measurement of success, speed to value, we really embrace that we had to demonstrate economic impact and value every 90 days. This is interesting. I'm sure you have this conversation with your CEO and your board. I certainly had it. We need funding. And I have to say, what we found, certainly true for us, is we did not need new funding. Uh, this helped us. Our focus, my commitment to our CEO and the board was, we will self-fund digital. What that does, I think at least for us, was it helped us really start with the no regrets, right? The IT team, our CIOs here, were absolutely part of this journey. In a period of less than a year during a pandemic, we eliminated 1,000 applications, we simplified, we took a lot of cost out, and funded digital. Uh, you know, the commitment I made to our CEO was that every dollar that we would invest, self-invest in digital, will have the highest return of any dollar in the organization. And actually, in the first 18 months, the average return for our projects was about 300% within six months. I tell you that because for us, these have been some of the elements that have uh, accelerated, perhaps fueled our digital journey. We're certainly not done. Uh, I'd say we're probably halfway through. But the biggest win we had is about our culture. You know, I'm sure there were very smart people before me that claimed to do digital transformations, frankly, any type of transformation. But you know, for us, our culture, our people, you know, Lindell's got an incredible culture. We're very safety focused. Uh, we know continuous improvement. What perhaps we needed to do was get introduced to, to what good looks like in digital. So I'll tell you a little story. Uh, my boss at that time, Bob Patel, has been our CEO for a few years. 
uh, we start to meet, uh, you can imagine, CEOs of large and small um, digital companies. And uh, Bob asked me, hey, did you know Tom Siebel? And I chuckled because we had just started to engage with Ed and Tom and the team. And so we have a meeting. And uh, Tom walks in the boardroom, and literally in a half hour, here I have my CEO, who's a chemist uh, engineer, talking about the complexity of making polymer and how sophisticated and complicated it is and the types of things he struggled with for 30 years in the industry. Tom's talking about explaining to Bob, a chemical engineer, AI, data models, elastic data models. But you know what was interesting there was the conversation quickly shifted to how do we generate value? And not just value for the current day. You know, the things we like about C3 AI, clearly it's state-of-the-art technology. This is, we were here two years ago at Transform. We watched the US Air Force 3M shell demonstrate industry-shaping solutions. Scale is something we like because without scale in our industry, in our business, you don't achieve economic impact. But I have to say, the thing that really appealed to our CEO was the mindset, the focus on customer. We had met a lot of people who were trying to sell us a lot of things. The thing that we liked, we talk about a culture of being humble and hungry. We really like that culture at C3. But more importantly, we found inspiring is that ultimately the focus on the value chain is really about the customer. It's that simple. So that's where I think we have to match. We've laid out, uh, you know, our company is probably like many companies, as many suppliers. We have maybe 15,000, 20,000 suppliers. C3 is one of 35 companies we have chosen to go on a long-term journey and partnership with. Uh, it's different for us. You know, we're in an industry that is very quick to uh, issue force majeure letters. Um, we are very focused on reliability. Uh, and, and, you know, we have a lot to learn. Um, a, a large chemical company working with a very small but very nimble and agile Silicon Valley company, the opportunities we can create some magic together. So, uh, Anybody familiar with the Purdue model? Raise your hands if you are. Not the basketball team. They, I don't think, made it to the Sweet 16. So when we built plants in the 60s, we, by the way, have a 100-year-old refinery that still runs. This is the model. These three layers down here don't talk to anything. You've probably heard about advanced process control. We've been doing advanced process control at our plants for 25 years. The best in the industry is ExxonMobil. And over a period of time, Sometimes you'll hear Lionel Bazell's name mentioned at being good at doing this. You know, it's important to liberate trapped data across this chain, but let's just be clear. The risks are tremendous. You know, we heard from some very well-qualified people. Uh, Dr. Rice yesterday talked about the risk. That doesn't mean you don't do things. It just means you have to build capability and security into what you do, because that's how we built our plants. So there are four things we think about a lot today. We think about how do you protect the most sensitive of your assets that could impact critical infrastructure. We have this notion of zero or earned trust. We essentially think we cannot trust anybody, especially down here. But as we think about earned trust, those are the ways we think about and then, just like we do continuous improvement in a chemical plant, just like we think about continuous improvement in AI, this is how we think about continuous improvement in cybersecurity. But I want to talk to you about people. And they assure me that they did not coordinate uh, outfits when they took this picture. Well, it, oh, it's lavender. I don't think I own anything that's lavender. But uh, so Yang Kong on the left, Yang uh, has I think two PhDs. She uh, is an accomplished researcher, worked in the healthcare industry, cancer research, joined our small but mighty team of data scientists and data engineers, and it's just been amazing. 
So we asked Yang to uh, help us solve a very complex problem. We've been trying to improve inventory turns by one turn on a rail car fleet of 15,000 rail cars in North America for, I think, 10 years. Uh, you may have heard about this little storm we had, Storm Uri in Texas, uh, dramatically increased the need for a solution. In less than five months, with our supply chain team, with C3AI experts, Yang delivered an incredible solution in a very short period of time. I tell you that because Yang knew nothing of our rail cars. See, she certainly is not an expert in the chemical industry, but we created an environment where she felt she could contribute, work seamlessly with a C3 team, with our operations team. Max, if you get to know Max, he's super quiet. He's been on the IT team, was a contractor on the IT team for many years, became part of our data team, and was one of the people who felt probably in the past was left out of the digital transformation. Felt a bit envious maybe of this new stuff coming along. Well, I gotta tell you, Max, what you don't know about Max, he's done three Ironman triathlon. He is persistent, he wants to win, he is leading one of our largest value chain efforts within the digital team. You know, for us, it's a lot about making people like this successful in our focus on transformation. And then I'll just kind of uh, tell you about what's ahead. So I mentioned the winter storm. Uh, if, you, if you're in any type of industry, uh, you realize that your procurement and supply chain professionals are worth their weight in gold. Right? Imagine what we've been through. The speed, the responsiveness, uh, geopolitical risk, what's happening in China, what's happening in Russia. The ability for us to move quickly. We benefited greatly from the work Ed and Tom and the team have done with the US Air Force, with Baker Hughes, uh, with Cargill. I, I know you'll hear about that. So Lionel Bazell in the chemical industry got the benefit of supply chain innovation in many, many other industries that we were, we were able to harness and bring and use with our operators, with our planners, with the railroad providers. You know, manufacturing is the heartbeat of our company. Um, we have large assets. When these assets run, when they run reliably, we are able to utilize them and we serve our customers and essentially drive huge economic impacts. Some of our largest, so I mentioned we've been doing 25 years of advanced process control. Um, in some of our most integrated facilities, we utilize a lot of energy, electricity, heat. In our production process, we have these things called furnaces. And uh, furnaces have high temperature, high heat. They get a lot of coking. If you can figure out the decoking intervals to keep furnaces online, and by the way, you may say, oh, I'll just add another furnace. Well, that's hundreds of millions of dollars of capital. And you may not have the space on the plant to put a new furnace in. So imagine if you can generate new capacity by optimizing furnaces, optimizing the network, the infrastructure. Um, our philosophy using AI, using some of these new capabilities is changing. We were very focused on unit optimization. Always dreamt about multi-unit network optimization, and I have to say the, the early wins we're seeing um, are very promising, right? Uh, and I'll, you know, the last one I'll talk about is uh, a turnaround, probably for all of you and for me as well. You know, you take your car in for maintenance, you change the tires, you change the oil. Well, our plants run six, seven, eight years without ever stopping, and then, we plan, and we usually plan two to three years in advance, we do a turnaround. And this is a 60 to 70 day, 70 day event with thousands of people that then shut the plant down, clean it, inspect. You can imagine the consequence of not doing things well. And you know, seven, eight years ago, Lionel Bazell was fourth quartile, that's the bottom quartile, in cost and schedule. Um, we were good at safety, but certainly, if you're not good at cost and schedule, that means you have a lot of improvement to do. We've improved for the last three, four years, and this is benchmark, we're a little maniacal about benchmarking in our company. We've improved to almost second quartile, maybe first quartile. And we're told 
when contractors, people come work at our sites, they want to come to a Lyondell site because they know they'll be safe. They know that we will treat them with respect. They know that we are focused on quality, safety. But imagine if we could do a turnaround in five less days. The economic impact of that is hundreds of millions of dollars because your plant comes online, you make more product, it's safer. And, you know, all these CO2 emission changes you have to do, you have to create a window for the ability to do that. So these are the types of things we're working on with uh, Tom and Ed. I promised I will uh, end a few minutes early, so I'll give back five minutes, but I want to end with this. Um, we think about, just as we think about building the future five, ten years from now, the opportunity for all of us in this room is really represented here. Imagine that in 2030, 2040, no plastic will ever go into a landfill. That's pretty powerful. Imagine if with circular products, we could have plastic-free oceans, plastic-free rivers, that every plastic material that was made and is now being made will be completely circular. That's pretty bold. That will need a lot of transparency, trust, and collaboration. We have not even imagined the solutions it will take to build those. Um, climate change. Every one of us is issuing very bold aspirations. You know, what is our scope two is somebody's scope three. What is somebody's scope one is our scope three. We have armies of people trying to measure, armies of folks trying to check. Well, what if we had real time? You know, Dan showed a, a preview of this. A way, and frankly, Shell and Lionel Bazell have a long history. We are on integrated sites together. If we focused on solving some of these things of transparency, real-time measurement, imagine how much capacity that would free up to do things. And then finally, I'll just leave you with, I have two daughters. When I think about, will they ever be inspired to come work in the chemical industry? Will they think that these companies that are viewed as industries of the past, would they have a role? I mean, space exploration, think about it. In the next decade, what humans are gonna do in space, the innovation that's going to happen, light weighting of materials, fuel efficiency, how do we create this thriving society vision together? That's how we think about it, and, and no pressure, Ed. I think you and Thomas will tell us after the break on how we bring this to life. So with that, thank you very much, and you get three minutes back.